But here we are, Ecclesiastes for Beginners. This is lesson number 12, the final one in the series, entitled Positive Thinking, Positive Thinking, and we'll be covering Ecclesiastes chapter 11. So if you want to go there in your Bibles. So up until this point, Solomon's journal has been actually quite skeptical, um, downright depressing at times. Uh, he's seen everything, he's done everything, and found that the cycle of events in life is empty and without true meaning. Conclusion, I've done everything a man can do, and wow, is that all there is? His search for happiness without God has led him to despair. Again, I remind you when he says under the sun, it means here on earth, without reference to God. Then we saw in his return to God, he has found that wisdom and wise living is the way to go here under the sun, but your life is short and the best way to enjoy what little time you have is to have a relationship with God. So yeah, it's good, you can find meaning if you have a relationship with God, but even if you have that, realize that it's a short life anyways. So in these last chapters, his tone is going to change to being a little more optimistic as he grows closer to God and further away from his old lifestyle, his old thinking. So by the time he finishes the book, he's very positive and encourages his readers to be that way as well. So if we start in chapter 11, Solomon tells his readers that God's plan for man is not that he suffer or be afraid or become depressed. God does not want us to be that way. God's plan for man is to be optimistic, to hope for the best, to think positive, because God wants to bless us and see us rejoice in our lives as much as sinful and weak people possibly can under the circumstances. That's the caveat right there. He wants you to be positive. He wants to bless you. He wants you to have a, a, a happy life. He wants that for you, but because life is short and because we're sinful and because we make mistakes and because we make bad choices and all that business, yeah, it doesn't always work that way. But it's not because he wants that. You know, I think I mentioned a few lessons back, don't, don't think God is the one that's sending the bad stuff in your life. That's, he doesn't do that. He lets you deal with that, but He's not the one who sends it. So in chapter 11, Solomon exhorts people to adopt this kind of lifestyle, this positive mindset, by resetting your attitude to include a new or more positive way of living and thinking about things, and this new mindset has three key attitudes that he shares with his readers. Attitude number one, instead of defense, think offense. Doesn't say it that way. He says, cast your bread on the surface of the waters for you will find it after many days. You know, people are usually playing it too safe. They want to hold back. They want to take a second and a third look before venturing forth. Solomon says, instead of looking for ways of always protecting yourself, try releasing yourself to your full potential. Now this is not a call to be reckless and foolish, but rather a reminder of what someone can accomplish if they step out in faith. So when you get adventurous for God, that's the point. When you get adventurous for God, there's always a return. There's always a return. I've never stepped out and done something in the name of the Lord or done something that might serve the kingdom or took a chance or you know, stepped out of my comfort zone or whatever in my own life that I was not rewarded. And I don't, I don't mean, oh, the elders say, yeah, yeah, well, very good, you're going to get a raise in pay. No, not that kind of reward. Where I wasn't rewarded in some way. <laughs> the best example, you know, seven years ago we were living in Montreal and our kids were scattered everywhere. I mean, except Emily and Hal, they were living in Montreal. 
And uh, I thought you know, our work was done in, in Montreal and, and I thought of coming back to Oklahoma and Lisa and I were talking about that. Nobody in the family was for that. But in my mind and in my heart I knew this was a kind of a place where if there was ever a home for us that was here. And I mean it was counterintuitive, it wasn't the right, it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe. It's a long story, we finally moved you know, stepped out in faith. Came back, not as the quote pulpit minister, there was a pulpit minister, came back, did education, something I hadn't done. And seven years later, what happened? Well, all the kids are here. The 11 grandkids are all here. They're all worshiping in this place. And I know that annoys you, but you know. It wasn't a money reward or a, you know. A God always rewards us when we, when we call on Him and we step out in faith to do something that in some way will build up the kingdom or enable us as far as people of faith. So instead of defense, think offense. Key number two, instead of hoarding, Try giving. He says, divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. Remember, this is all in the context of faith in God, right? These, this advice here. Trying to save and hoard and protect yourself by yourself at the expense of charity or good works will not work. At best, you end up having money, but no peace and no joy. Or you lose it all anyways. Solomon reminds us of a spiritual rule of thumb, one that you, know, you ask our kids, they know this one by heart. The more you give, the more you get. The more you give, the more you get. And that's not just you know, put money in the plate. Obviously, a preachers, you know, they would obviously make that first application. I'm not talking about that. In your marriage, the more you give, the more you get. In your friendships, the more you give, the more you... At your, at your career and at your job and in your business, the more you give, the more you get back. Jesus reminds us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's because there is more satisfaction and potential for personal blessings to one who is a generous giver of time, money, affection, service, talent, whatever, than there is for the one who hoards all these things. The bottom line for hoarders, what, what, what emotion is tied to hoarding? Fear. Fear. Fear that I won't have enough. Fear that I won't have this thing. Fear. Hoarding is just a, a way to push back fear. Solomon says, you, know, you, you want to get rid of fear, you know, just give it away. Stop hoarding, not just stuff, but just stop hoarding everything. Open yourself up. If you can get to the point where nothing here on earth represents your um, safety except your trust and faith in God, yeah, you're going to find out what flying is like. You know what I mean? I don't mean flying like this. I mean flying, soaring spiritually. But the more stuff you hoard, the more it kind of keeps you on earth. It keeps you walking by sight. My stuff means I'm safe. Instead of hoarding, try giving. The secret here is that the blessing is not to those who receive what you give. The secret here is you're the one who will receive the most. Key number three, instead of watching, try doing. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. 
And whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, whether, uh, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. So Solomon mentions some very normal phenomena here. For example, you know, clouds that give rain, trees that grow and fall, sowing, the cycle of sowing and reaping. The implication is that there are natural cycles of things that happen, actions and reactions, laws of creation that are observable. So we can simply watch these things happen and be simple observers of life or we can be people that put these things to work for us in order to achieve things. It's another way of expressing the idea is that it's no use worrying about things you cannot change. Concentrate on the things you can change or those things you can exploit for your good. How much time have we wasted in our lives fretting and worrying over the past. Can you imagine how much emotional, spiritual energy just in this room, collectively, I mean, you know, we could pull a, we could pull a train with that energy. Jump into life, do something. Don't just sit there. Solomon is saying, don't just sit there watching the tree fall, watching the clouds go by, wondering is it going to rain or not? That's not how the farmers, you know, farmers, if they had it, say, well, should I or shouldn't, you know? They get out there and they plant. That's what we need to do. Did I say three keys? Four keys, four keys. Key number four. Instead of doubting, try trusting. Verse five and six. He says, just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. You can't know all the variables. It's prudent, you know, I mean, we have to be prudent in life. We have to kind of look you know, before we leap, so to speak. But we, can't, we cannot calculate all the variables. That's what he's saying here. Stuff happens. You can't guarantee the outcome. Somewhere along the line, you have to have some faith and trust in God. Many people want to know the end before they begin. You know, it's like, Lord, I'm, you, know, you can't believe how much I could do for you, Lord. I'm ready to give my all, Lord. All I want is a little upfront money. <laughs> yeah. You know, something, a project has 10 steps till the final goal and it's a worthy goal. And the only step that God shows you is step number one, all the rest you can't see. And a lot of people say, well, Lord, I, you know, I'm a man of faith, but you, know, you got to show me steps, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, eight, nine, 10. And if you show me, then I'll take all those 10 steps. Well, that's not faith, that's walking by sight. The Lord sometimes only gives you step number one or two, you know? And you have to walk by faith. By, walking by faith means you leave the safety of the shore, if you wish, and you take step one and two with the risk that you'll be out there on step number two, too far away from shore to go back and too far away from the goal to take another step because you don't know what step three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 is. That's what faith is. Solomon advises that we go with what we know. We sow the seed in the morning and we do our best. We leave the rest to God. Keep trying. Multiply your efforts because you never know when and which one of your efforts God will bless. Gene Autry, an old uh, cowboy, country western, he was an actor, um, 
he was a cowboy actor and the Western movies he made back in the 30s, I think, 20s and 1920s and 30s. And, and uh, he, would, he was also a singer and he put out a lot of you know, songs. And so he put out a song, you know, uh, he wrote a song, put out a song and um, you know, uh, back in the day when you had 45 records, you, know, you had the flip A side, B side. The A side was the song that everyone was going to promote and that was your good song. And then you had to find another song for B side and you didn't want to put your two best songs on the same 45 because you know, that was wasteful. You put your A side, a good song and a cheap, you know, not so good song and you sold that record and then if you had another good song, well you put out another 45 so you can make some money. So he had this song on the A side, I don't even remember what the song was, the B side, you know what the song was? Some dumb kid song called Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> right, well we all know what happened, right? Rudolph, the, to this day we keep singing, you know how many, every time that song is sung, Every time, it's been re recorded, I don't know how many covers have been made of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Gene Autry's estate, cha-ching, still making money, he's dead, I don't know how many years he's dead, the estate is still making money off of that little ditty, Rudolph the red he, he didn't know. Same thing, you, you never know which one of your things is finally going to hit. So Solomon begins his final exhortation with a call for us to think and act positively with wisdom and effort, of course, being careful not to lose faith when things slow down or when we're not sure of the results. So final ideas, number one, think positive. Final idea number two, don't procrastinate. When we talk about procrastinators, we're usually talking about people who continually put off uh, unpleasant tasks or responsibilities to future dates. And I have explained in the past that this is a form of laziness or self-centeredness. For example, I want to do what I want to do now. This other thing has to get done but you know what, I'd rather do what I want to do now. So I'm going to, get, I'm going to push this other thing to later because I want to do what I want to do. Or I want to delay effort and work as long as I can. So this thing that needs to get done, that's my job, that's my responsibility, I'm going to push it away because you know what, I don't like to use my brain. I don't like to make an effort. So I'm going to pick something easy, something that I like, and I'm going to push forward till later or till tomorrow, the thing that I don't like to do or that requires effort. That's procrastination. Solomon talks about another form of procrastination here. And that is people who put off enjoying their lives until some future event or time. That's another form of procrastination. For example, I'll be happy when I have more money. You know, now I'm not happy, but the, you know, in a year I'm going to, you know, they're going to bump me up my salary and then I'm going to, then I'm going to be happy. Or I'm going to enjoy my life when I, when I meet the right person. I just haven't met the right person yet and so you know, uh, no wonder I'm unhappy. I haven't met the right person. Or we'll start enjoying ourselves when the kids are gone. I got news for you. The kids are never gone. All the parents going, uh-huh, that's right. <laughs> now the reason people feel like that are many, but one root cause is that of greed. I know, again, really? They believe that happiness is based on having more of something or something in particular. When I have a mate, when I have a job, when I've achieved this goal, when I move over there, when I, you know? Greed is the sin of never having or never being satisfied with what you actually have. And so unless you learn to be satisfied with what you already have, you will never be satisfied with what you desire. That's how greed works. It always focuses your eyes on tomorrow 
or having more or having something different. On the way to church this morning, my wife said, oh, just out of the blue, she's driving, she says, oh, the grass is always greener, out of nowhere, and I looked to the side and I saw what she was talking about. There were a bunch of cows in a field, plenty of grass, and there was you know, barbed wire there, and there was this old cow sticking her head through the wire, trying to get to the grass on the, you know, with, the, with the pricklies in her neck and everything, trying to get to the grass that was just a foot on the other side of the fence. We're like that sometimes. <laughs> we stick our neck through the barbed wire of desire and greed, you know, why? Because we, we think the future or that or that other little shiny thing is just going to make us happier. Solomon says that our joy and satisfaction today is linked not to what we have, but rather to the relationship that we have with God. And he explains this idea in the following way. He says, first of all, God permits us to enjoy life now. Chapter 11, verse seven and eight a, he says, the light is pleasant and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all. Light and sun were images used in scripture to depict God's love and protection. Psalm 27 verse one talks about this. And so Solomon uses these to represent the warmth and the security of God's love present in every single day. In other words, just like the sun is out every single day and it warms you and gives you that you know, warm feeling every single day, God's love is available every single day and is able to bless you every single day. Just as the sun is there every day, God's love is there every day. And so God's love and blessings are available each day and He has given us the permission to be happy and enjoy His love now. No reason to wait. Second point he makes, Take advantage of your blessings now. Verse 9a, he says, Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of, your young, uh, of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. In that time, youth, you know, in the time of Solomon, young people had to toe the line and build a life to be enjoyed later. Solomon says that you should enjoy your youth and whatever other blessings you may have while you have them. This isn't selfish, it's common sense, it's healthy. It explains why people want to come to the USA. We have the kind of you know, environment here that permits one to live their lives freely. We can move, you know, in China you got to get permission to move, you got to get permission from the government to move from one city to another city. I remember doing a Bible study online with several uh, you know, Chinese individuals in, lived, living in China at the time who had never been to the West and you know, through Skype, I was teaching them the Bible, through Bible talk actually. And one of the ladies said to me, oh yeah, I'm waiting for my papers. What papers? Well, permission to move from this apartment to that apartment, from the government. Imagine if you had to get permission from the government to move from one house to another. In some societies, to marry one person or another. To have more than one child, that's being relaxed now, but for how long? You paid a fine. If you had child number two, you paid a fine. We here, we live where we want, we eat what we want, we go where we want, we marry who we want, we do the work we want or no work at all. You know, I mean, we're, why do you think people are lined up to come here? There's no lineup at the Iranian embassy to get in. Why is that? Because here people are free to live their lives. Now you may be wondering, that's a political statement. What is he talking about in connection with this? Well, how many people who have all of this freedom and all of these blessings that this country affords us and are still miserable because <laughs> they don't have enough? <laughs> 
Solomon is telling it, take advantage of your blessings now. Start counting them. Realize what you have. Another point he makes, there are no guarantees. He says, and let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility, yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Fleeting, and I look around and I see a lot of grandparents here. Doesn't it go by quickly? Life just, boom, goes by in a flash. And so Solomon warns that if you don't rejoice now, if you put it off until the future, you know, your happiness into the future, it may not come. Your ship may not come in. He also adds that even though you should take full advantage of your gifts and situation now, you must do so within God's will because you will be judged eventually. Yes, enjoy your life now. And you can do so legitimately, but be careful. Be careful what it is that you enjoy, because you're going to be judged for it. So he's not saying, you know, do what you want, for tomorrow you may die. He's saying, be merry and rejoice in what is good, because tomorrow you will be judged on how you used what God gave you. And realize there's no guarantee. You're healthy now, good for you. Use your health because it only takes a moment and I, without mentioning any names, just in this congregation, we've had two young men in, the, in their early 30s, just one day standing there and then passing out with brain aneurysms and other things. Strong, healthy young men who had no history of any type of thing are now in the hospital struggling for their lives. One of them, on the day he was registering for his PhD. In other words, I'm, I'm going to go for my doctorate. Yeah, boy. And when I get my doctorate, yeah, it's all going to be great. You know, boom. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to belittle him. I'm just, I'm just saying you know, his plans were all, and what they should be when you're a young person, of course. We're going to have a family. We're going to do this. We're going to sell the small house and build a bigger house. Yes, absolutely but there's no guarantee of that. So if you think you're only going to be happy when you got the big house, be careful. Because if you're not happy in the little house, then you're not going to be any happier in the big house. Now, I don't mean the prison, the big house. I mean <laughs> the larger home. <laughs> Another point he makes, the essential ingredient for happiness today is to have a relationship with God today. Remember also your creator, he says, in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Happiness is not based on how well we live or how much we have. It's based on how well we obey and how much of God's will is being achieved in our lives. Yes, we have a goal in our careers. Ministers have careers and they have goals as well as architects and engineers and whoever, you know, wherever you're at, that's okay. But my main goal in life, not because I'm a minister, but because I'm a Christian, my main goal in life is to sharpen my ability to obey God. To work out spiritually so I am stronger spiritually and more able to resist temptation to fall into sin. That's the end game. I have my ministry, I have my career, you know, that pays the bills, that gives me a lot of satisfaction under the sun, but that's not my end game. My end game is to be completely in submission to the Spirit of God and His Word. That's my end game. You can't always have the home, the education, the mate, the situation that you desire for your life today, but you can have God in your life today and it is this ingredient that guarantees happiness. God's love and will are the only things you can legitimately desire more and more of without harming yourself. 
You know, ice cream is good, but too much is not good. Right? Loving God and seeking God is good and you can never get too much of that. So Solomon shows us that the things that keep us from enjoying each day are that we keep our eyes on tomorrow rather than today and we keep our hope on ourselves and things instead of completely relying on God each and every day. All right, so the, the big ideas now, let's keep them in mind. One, think positively. Two, don't procrastinate. If you can't be happy today, you know, with what you got today, then you won't be happy tomorrow with the stuff you think you're going to get. Third big idea, grow old gracefully. Grow old gracefully. Of course, no matter how well we live each day, the days do go by and all of us do grow older. There's no use denying it, fighting it, or regretting it. And since aging is inevitable, Solomon provides more godly wisdom regarding the process that so many find so difficult, so, so depressing. So the first thing he says is about aging, accept the obvious. So he says, before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through windows grow dim and the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low and one will arise at the sound of the bird and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along and the caper berry is ineffective for man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. So in these verses, Solomon describes in poetic fashion the deterioration that comes with age, both mental and physical. You know, he says, the bird, you know, the idea is just the, the chirping sound of a bird outside is enough to wake you up very early in the morning. Whereas when you're a young person, you know, I see young men, young people, teenagers, they go to bed at 11 p.m. and they sleep till 12 noon the next day. And I'm thinking, how did, without getting up to go to the bathroom, how do they do that? <laughs> so the young guys, they're going, huh? Well, what's he talking about? And all the old guys are, going, are laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Now these things are not pleasant, but something made harder to bear because people refuse to accept this or cling to images of their youth. With acceptance comes peace and also the ability to enjoy life without the pressure and competition of youth. Growing old is hard enough without trying to be young without pretending that you're young, when you're not anymore. Another thing about growing old gracefully, prepare for the obvious. In verse six and seven he says, remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed, then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So prepare for the obvious. The signs of aging are also the signs of death. Aging should focus our minds on being prepared for this inevitable fact. It is an act of mercy that God allows us to deteriorate slowly so we have the time to become aware and prepared for our own death. Imagine if we stayed young, 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 you know, all the time, young, 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 you know, for, you know, till we were the average age for men, 79 point something. And at 79 point something, you're young, you're strong, you're virile, you're dead. I mean, you know, it would be traumatic. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't always work this way. You know, some people die young, of course. But in normal circumstances, we have time to prepare. And Solomon says, we should use that time. You know, I, I had to fill out a, you know, your living will type thing and now they keep it all in a central location online in case you have an emergency and 
you're at the hospital and you don't have your will with you and this and that, they want to know, do you have some sort of advanced directive? You know, how, do, you, you know, do, not, do you have a DNR, a do not resuscitate clause? You know, in an emergency, they need to know that right away. So I filled it out, you know, the hospital. And, it, and there was a question about your faith and God and religion, anything you want, anything you want there. You, know, you call a priest or whatever. And in the box I wrote, I am a faithful Christian and I am at peace with God, period. That's not instructions, that's a statement. I'm a, I'm, I'm a faithful Christian and I am at peace with God. So don't go pounding on me. If I'm going to die, <laughs> just let me die. Don't beat me up you know, to, to keep me alive for three more days. <coughs> Wipe out the small savings that I have you know, to pay for machinery. Don't do that to me. I know where I'm going. I've prepared for this my whole life. Number three, you got to move here, almost done. Growing old gracefully, acknowledge the obvious. He says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So Solomon as well as many other famous philosophers and writers searched for meaning without God and came up with the same conclusion that all is vanity, what he says in verse eight. Philosophers before and after him also concluded this to their despair. In verses nine to 12, he summarizes his own personal search, his own fruitless journey in the search for happiness through the use of wisdom and great knowledge. However, unlike the atheistic philosophers of ancient Greece and the so-called enlightened philosophers of the modern and postmodern age, Solomon came to a different conclusion. Yes, he came to a conclusion all his vanity like they did, but he went one step further. He instructs his readers in verses 13 and 14 that happiness and meaning can only be found in God. Unlike the others, Solomon humbles himself and finally acknowledges that obedience and devotion to God are what give life its potential for joy and meaning. And this God has made plain through his creation and man's conscience and the revealed word of God if only man will listen and acknowledge. Almost done here, one more comment. And so in the end, Solomon says that life is short and death is sure, but for the one that seeks God and obeys Him, there are three promises. Number one, there is satisfaction in each day if only we look for it. If only we look for it. Number two, there is peace regardless of age or position. And that peace begins and ends with faith in God. If you don't have peace of mind, the search begins with the search for God. And finally, number three, he says, there is hope when life is over. We have heaven for those who have been faithful. And so let's take to heart all of this wise advice from the book of Ecclesiastes. That's the end of our series. I want to thank all of you. You've been a pretty good group. God bless you.